the vastness, the emptiness, and the sheer grandeur of this West Mayo landscape, the young woman who wants to relive and, if possible, revive the glories of Ireland's monastic past. Dubliner Irene Gibson made history two years ago when she became the first professed hermit in this country in over 800 years. This weekend, she strode purposefully into this hauntingly beautiful valley in the shadow of Kirkpatrick and announced her plans to build a new monastic community for hermit nuns around the tiny house at the foot of these hills. Well, I, would, I would say that um, this would hopefully be the beginning of a hermit community, the first hermit community for women in Ireland, and the first hermit community um, in the country since, since the 12th century. And um, the little house that you see there, we would hope to turn that into a refectory for the sisters, but also at the back, la the land at the back of the house, we want to build individual hermitages for sisters. Um, and of course we need to build a church and a guest house, where um, guests will come and people, people who feel they need to come aside for a retreat will be able to come also. This will be different than the usual religious orders where each sister is living under one roof. In this type of community, each sister will live in a separate hermitage and she'll spend the best part of her day in this hermitage. Um, she'll meet the other sisters twice a day for prayer and she'll never break silence except once a week when the sisters will come together to, to go for a long walk and talk together. Um, apart from that, she will be living a very solitary hermit life, and each of the sisters will be doing the same. Sister Irene, who turned her back on life as a laboratory worker and a computer programmer, spent four years in a Benedictine monastery before deciding she wanted to become a hermit, seeking out the solitude of the Mayo countryside to undertake a life of physical work, of prayer, and of reflectiveness. Sister Irene says she hopes that 12 more women will join her here to form the first hermit community since the days of the early Celtic church. This old forester's house is where the 34-year-old Dubliner plans to lay the foundation of her new order. She says she believes it will take at least £70,000 to build the complex, but she's confident that the money will be found. This is, this is it now. This is, the, this is the house that we're hoping to buy. And we, we hope to turn this into a repertory for the sisters and maybe the room down, down there as uh, the kitchen area. Hopefully um, we will get voluntary assistance also. People, people have been wonderful. A lot of the locals have actually come to me and said that they would like to help me and fix the table for me. They will do the voluntary work to save me some money to fix the place and, and to get the raw material to fix the place. I mean, I probably am a little bit mad, but I mean, as I said, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, for, a fool for Christ. And it's just a dream and a vision, and there's a lot of sisters interested in, in, in joining with me, and we just hope that it will become a reality and wouldn't always remain a dream. Wise men come and ask, why this waste? To what purpose the spending of human life in obscurity? Why the building, the carving, 
the engraving and the chanting, why cling to legends? If their wisdom were deeper, they would ask, where is the source of such endurance and faith? What unseen hand guided the artist and the scribe in their silent and lifelong task? When I was when I was a very young child, my father used to bring us um, to Glendalough and other monastic settlements around Ireland, and I was always fascinated by monastic settlements. And I think I've always retained that spirit, the love for the early Celtic monks, and I used to love to read about them. And I always had somehow a monastic calling. I think when I was a very young child also, my mother had a radiogram, and I used to play with the buttons on the radiogram and tune into Gregorian chant. And even though I might have been only seven, I would stop at this Gregorian chant and go into literally into ecstasy listening to the monks chanting. And I think that was the beginning of my calling to um, a monastic way of life. Irene Gibson's search for the hermit knight took her first to a Benedictine monastery in England, then to a Carthusian retreat house in Italy, and finally back to Ireland, where she wandered from diocese to diocese for several years. There were periods on the Aran Islands, at Rosnook in Connemara, and finally she came to Drummond near Westport, where this battered old mobile home now serves as a temporary yet somewhat incongruous roadside monastery. And here, as she contemplates the future, Sister Irene says she's overwhelmed by the warmth of the welcome and support she's been given by the local people. They're very, very friendly people, and you're never, that, you're never short of a bag of turf or a loaf of bread. And they've just been so kind to me. Some would drop me in a loaf of bread, and some would give me a bag of turf, and others would just send me a few cakes, which I don't really eat very much of, but I would never refuse anything. A small, hand-operated printing press, which occupies a corner of a caravan home, has helped the young hermit raise some money. Hand-painted pictures of the saints are reproduced to make greeting cards which are sold to the public. And Sister Irene says that once the new community has moved to its more permanent home on the edge of the mountain forest, everybody will have to roll up the sleeves and get down to the tough and unromantic work of helping the order become as self-sufficient as possible. We will be working by the, war, uh, the, the labor of our own hands, we will be doing um, craft work and we will be working the, the earth, the soil. We will also hopefully keep some, some um, small farm animals like poultry and uh, goats or whatever to provide the table. People think of it as a very romantic life and they, they see a hermit as an old man up on a hill with a beard and they, they think of it as somebody out there sitting on their own, eating roots, so uh, I don't know. So I do find that very funny, really, because it's anything but romantic and it's anything but easy. In fact, very, very much, if you're, if you're anyway romantic and that way inclined, you'll probably find the life impossible, um, because it can be a lonely life and it can be a difficult life, um, where you do face face yourself all day long, and it's very important then that we can be psychologically balanced in this kind of life. We might climb the heavens, you are there, if I lie in the grave, you are there. If I take Contemplative, round-the-clock prayer beginning each morning at 4 a.m. is at the center of every hermit's life. Here in County Mayo, in a roadside caravan, Sister Irene says there's never been a greater need for prayer. I think prayer is, is extremely important today, more than ever today, in, in our very commercialized world. It's very, very important where people are being drawn into um, a great deal of activity and very much also that people are becoming more and more intelligent and independent and feeling that they don't need God. 
And I think we need to get back to the awareness that we can do nothing without God, and that we need him for everything, and that he is really the happiness that we are pursuing in life. There's a poem by an early monk, and I'm not sure if they, they know who wrote the, the poem, but it says, um, Grant, Lord, the grace to find, Son of the living God, a small foot in a lonesome spot to make it my abode, a little pool but very clear to stand beside the place where all men's sins are washed away by sanctifying grace. My share of clothing and of food from the king of their space, and to sit at times alone and to pray in every place. So God found you are in, O Lord, make grace to help us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hallelujah.